my name is Leslie Lavoie and I'm a social media correspondent for the College of Music and Dramatic Arts. I am here today with Steven Tepper who is from the Curb Center for Art, Enterprise and Public Policy from Vanderbilt University. So welcome. Thank you Leslie, good to be here. Good, I'm glad you're here too. Okay, so let's start off talking about um, how the center at Vanderbilt was started and who Mike Curb is and the inspiration behind all that. All right, well that's a a long story I'll try to make a little shorter. Um, the founding director of the Curb Center um, is Bill Ivey, and Bill Ivey was uh, the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts under Bill Clinton. Um, and Bill's training is as a folklorist, and he uh, had a lot of uh, experience in the, um, in the popular music world. He was twice the chair of the, mu of the Recording Academy and head of the Country Music Hall of Fame and the Country Music Foundation. So he kind of went to Washington with not a traditional arts hat, mm -hmm. um, really thinking much more broadly about culture and all the different ways that Americans engage with arts and culture, not just through the nonprofit arts. Um, so when he was in Washington, I think he felt that um, lots of decisions were being made that affected how most Americans were engaging with arts and culture, policies and regulations, um, international trade, um, and, uh, and most of the people who cared about the arts were focused very narrowly on whether they could get another few million dollars to the National Endowment for the Arts. And he saw that as a very constricted way to think about policy because most people actually aren't uh, spending their lives in symphonies or theaters, but they're listening to the radio mm -hmm. and they're engaging with film and art and culture uh, and media as part of their everyday life. But things like the um, uh, 1996 radio deregulation, which affected whether towns had local DJs and had locally owned radio stations, and whether artists could get into um, could get could get a break by getting heard on the radio station. Those issues were not even being thought about as part of our cultural policy landscape. Hmm. They were left to corporations to make their arguments and to make the rules. Um, issues like uh, intellectual property and whether people could uh, borrow, uh, use you know, fair use in order to digitally sample or to do documentary films without getting uh, license approvals from, from every piece of music they wanted to use or issues about whether the Baywatch should be the most uh, popular cultural export to the Middle East, which it was at that time. These were like big questions about our cultural life that he felt that nobody was asking. So if he, he wanted to start a center that would ask a broader set of questions about what is the public interest in art and culture, mm -hmm. and what are the business practices and the public policies that influence that. And so he had a chance to get paired up with Mike Kerb. Um, so this would have been after uh, after Al Gore did not prevail in the election and there was going to be a transition, um, Vanderbilt went to Washington and said, you know, Bill, we'd like to bring you back to Nashville where he uh, was, had previously run the Country Music Hall of Fame and we want you to start a center and what kind of center do you want to start? And he said, well, I want to start a center called the Center for Art, Enterprise, and Public Policy and I want us to take a bigger, a bigger picture uh, look at uh, art and culture in this country. And then uh, within a, f you know, a few months of being in, in back at Vanderbilt, or back in Nashville, a longtime friend of Bill's, Mike Kerb, who um, is one of the most successful independent record um, uh, company mm -hmm. owners um, in the U.S., um, he probably has the largest independent record company, um, or it's the smallest major record label, whichever one you want to you say. Well, Mike w was, uh, is an interesting character because he... Um, has, has a life in politics and a life in art. Mm -hmm. He started this record label. He's a, he's a composer, a uh, very successful musician, but he also served as lieutenant governor of California under Ronald Reagan and um, chairman of the Republican Party Finance Committee. Um, and so he was interested in public policy and leadership. He's also interested in culture. And so the center seemed to be a perfect match for, for, uh, for Mike Kerb. So Mike gave a very generous endowment to the center and. Uh, and that's how it started. Very cool. So what kind of work do you do at that center? What different projects are you all working on right now? Yeah, so we have a, a whole range of, of policy-related um, research and, uh, and, and convening and meetings. Um, right now, uh, you know, my work focuses on cultural conflict, and we might mm -hmm. talk about that um, and its relationship to democracy. We have a very large project looking at um, the training of artists in America and um, 
uh, uh, surveying, uh, we've surveyed over 50,000 uh, former art students in America to try and understand what they do with their lives and how their training was or was not relevant, and helping art schools think about revising their curricular, curriculum. Um, we also have a big project looking at the advantages of double majoring in an art and a non-art subject and whether you have some creative payoff That's interesting. From, from doing that. Um, we, uh, um, we, 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 we work with cities to think about cultural planning and, and how, do you, how do you devise uh, um, measures of cultural vitality in, in a community. Um, so there's a whole range of, uh, of projects and, and creativity in higher education is also our, our really big focus when we talk more about that, but ha you know, what are the policies and practices that universities can put in place to make sure not only the arts but creativity more generally is centrally part of the way we think about teaching and learning. So those are kind okay. of some of the issues that we're dealing do with. Do some of your, does some of your work that you do at the Curb Center influence policy in Washington or how does that relate? Yeah. Um, so we've tended to, to not um, uh, take specific policy positions, so mm -hmm. we're not writing uh, policy briefs and advocating one policy or another. Um, we tend to kind of try and raise broader issues that we think people need to think about, but we have had for eight years something called the, um, uh, the Arts Policy um, Industry Forum in D.C., mm -hmm. where we've held these high-level meetings for senior level agency heads and, and career officials in all kinds of different departments in the U.S. government to meet on a monthly basis and talk about different issues of cultural policy, whether it's intellectual property or licensing um, or trade and cultural goods or the military and culture. Um, and, uh, and so that's been an ongoing project supported by the Ford Foundation. Um, very, you know, it's, what most people don't realize is that, um, you know, the National Endowment for the Arts and the Smithsonian, we tend to think, well, that's where arts policy gets made. Mm -hmm. um, but there's all kinds of policies uh, in the Federal Trade, Trade Commission, Federal Communications Commission, Homeland Security that passes policies that have impact on immigration and whether artists can travel to foreign countries or travel into our country. Um, the uh, um, uh, Department of Transportation spends a lot of money on culture and historical sites. Um, so. You know, just about every department in our U.S. government has a piece of the cultural pie. And part of our goal in Washington was to get those people around the table and actually start th thinking of themselves as a policy community. Okay. Um, so, so you kind of support the conversation about it conversation and about don't it. pick a position. We don't pick a position. We try, right. to, we try <coughs> to bring smart people in to talk to them mm -hmm. and, uh, and give them information that can help them uh, think about their jobs differently. Interesting. Okay, so tell me about this book that you wrote, Not Here, Not Now, Not That. And um, it talks about what turns um, personal offense into public protest. So um, if you could just explain what made you want to write this and kind of like the specific examples you use that you analyze. Sure. Um, so I guess my interest uh, began when I was uh, right out of college at the University of North Carolina, I was working for the administration and um, th for their development office. And one of my first assignments was to help with the installation of a class gift. And the class gift was a sculpture that was to be put in front of the public library. Hmm. And um, it had been commissioned before my time, but I was sort of helping with the final arrangements. And the sculpture um, turned out to be highly controversial. It had some it was called the student body, and it was kind of a series of bronze images of students doing various things, and uh, they tended to be um, quite stereotypical. So they had a, a mm -hmm. black student spinning a basketball on his finger. They had an Asian woman walking with a violin case. They had a black woman balancing books on her head as if it was a basket of fruit. They had a man and woman walking arm in arm with the woman holding an apple and the man reading a book. It was just every stereotype you could imagine seemed to be. And somehow we didn't see it coming, obviously we should have, but it caused this enormous firestorm mm -hmm. on campus. And at the time, uh, the university had not been a hotbed for protest. And uh, so I was just fascinated by why this art piece was able to create 
you know, essentially a protest where 30 or 40 people were yelling at each other mm -hmm. around the statue for two or three weeks, mm -hmm. right? So that was, uh, for me, that I, I wasn't a sociologist yet, but I was sort of fascinated by the power of art to provoke conversation. And that stayed with me. And then when I, you know, started observing cultural conflict across the country and how people would write about it, you know, it was often written about um, in one of two ways. One way was that, you know, you have these religious leaders or you have politicians that are like birds of prey that are just hovering, looking for a little arts controversy. They can just, you know, fly down and stoke up and, and get, you know, p get votes for or get fun funds for, you know, it's a way to mobilize their constituents. And the other explanation was that, you know, artists are just rabble rousers. They're just trying to push everybody's buttons. And, you know, if you pour, if you, if you go up on stage naked and pour chocolate over your body, you're going to get controversy. Or right. if you, know, you do these things that are controversial, then you shouldn't be surprised to get controversial art. But one of the things that I was recognizing is the same controversial art was only controversial in some places and not in others. So it was really about the art, right? Then we would expect that Angels in America, played by Tony Kushner, um, as it traveled across the country, would have caused controversy everywhere. Or a Marilyn Manson concert, right, a mm -hmm. rock concert, would have caused protest wherever it went. Um, but instead, some places responded with, with, with protests and other places didn't. So the big question for me was what's different about the place, not what's right. different about the art. And so I, I embarked on this very ambitious project to collect every case of controversy I could find across 70 U.S. cities and then um, and try and look at what correlated with the cities that fought the most. What was it about their culture, about their communities um, that led to uh, higher incidences of protest? So that was kind of the... Mm -hmm. And you talk about that, I, that's exactly what I was going to talk about next was um, in one of your chapters, you talked about, you looked at, you know, the most controversial cities and how they gravitated toward the uh, controversies. And I was curious where Baton Rouge and New Orleans landed on there. So I noticed that New Orleans is number 48 and Baton Rouge is number 59. So right. we're not very... Not highly <laughs> That's good to know. Um, and so I was wondering um, when you were, what process you went through to compile all that data? Did you travel a lot? Did you, was it a lot of, you know, correspondence between people and how you managed to figure out the most controversial cities? And we'll start yeah. with, we'll start there. <laughs> I'm getting well, ahead of myself. Um, the, the, the process of discovering the conflicts was, uh, you know, we created a very sophisticated algorithm okay. that could search newspapers. Um, that you know had all, all, every art, every word that related to the arts that you could think of, and then every word related to conflict that you could think of, and then we we looked for stories that had those two words, uh, you know, in some adjacency, um, and we got uh, you know so for a normal city, you might get uh, you know anywhere from two to five thousand articles because many of the hits were not relevant. You'd find an article that said, you know, the, uh, this film dealt with the fight between good and evil. Well, that's not an arts conflict, that's a film review. So it took a long time, a lot of man hours, a big staff of about 10 undergraduates who went through all these articles and they picked out the ones that were, were most relevant. Um, and in the end, we, you know, we probably had about 10,000 articles dealing with around uh, 805 cases. And uh, we went through those very carefully and then used those articles to kind of uh, to, 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 to answer questions about each city and each case. Um, and then we did statistical analysis based on those answers. Okay. So I actually didn't, uh, with one exception, didn't go to cities. Um, we did do some focus groups with parents that joined the local chapter of the Parents Television Council, which is a group mm -hmm. that's trying to clean up the airwaves. Mm -hmm. And so these were s citizens that would go and protest television. And we did go to a bunch of different cities to, um, to talk to parents, but other, most of the data came from newspapers. Okay, and so what was it about the m most controversial cities? What's different about their culture yeah. than the ones, say, like Baton Rouge and New Orleans, who aren't that controversial? Okay. So rates of, of immigration in the decade prior to the controversies were the, were the strongest uh, predictors of which cities would have the greatest numbers of conflicts. So, um, and it was a very robust finding, and uh, and it got reinforced not only by the way people talked about the conflicts in the stories and the op-eds and letters to the editor. Um, essentially, when things are up for grabs, when there's a lot of social change, and immigration is one form of social change, so people walk out their door and they say, well. 
things look a little different around here, right? The people who are, who are also on the school board don't look exactly the same, and um, you know, the person checking me out in the grocery store, and everything is, is, is sort of looking different. So immigra immigration is only one form of change, but it's a pretty visible one. Um, art becomes this arena where you can reassert whose values still matter in the community. So if you don't really know um, where your community is going, it's in kind of a moment of transition, then, uh, then, then fighting over what books belong in the library, what paintings belong in, in the museum, what songs belong on the radio, these are all ways in which people say, look, my values still matter, my voice still matters, you know, I need to be heard in this community, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, so even though people weren't fighting about immigrant art, um, the relationship between immigration and arts controversies was extremely strong. Um, and when you actually read the letters that people write and the way they talked, and when I talked to parents when we did travel to cities, uh, people often articulated the sense of, um, you know, that they were trying to bear witness to these uncomfortable changes. Like they couldn't sit by and watch their community change without saying something. Um, and hmm. and the, the arts were a way for them to say something. Interesting. Uh, so that's... It's an interesting twist. It's an inter so. Yeah, interesting twist. Um, so tell us what you're doing in Baton Rouge and kind of what you have planned and your experience in Baton Rouge so far. So I've met a lot of great people here in Baton Rouge. I think there's a real... It um, seems like the, the, um, uh, the College of, of Music and Dramatic Arts uh, has some great faculty and great students that are really committed to entrepreneurship and creativity, um, communications and media. It seems like a very innovative um, place to study the arts. Uh, you know, many art schools are still very much stuck in, in very old models of training, and it seems like there's a lot of openness here, so that's very exciting. Um, at the convocation today, I'm going to be talking about some of the research I've done on, uh, on people who have graduated from arts programs, and uh, I'm really interested in exploring uh, other ways of measuring the value of an arts degree. Um, you know, there are some very uh, uh, narrow ways to think about the value of going to college, which is, you know, right. getting a job, making a, a high income. Um, and uh, while it's true that arts graduates um, make slightly less than other people with equivalent education, uh, it's also true that they are happier than most other graduates and uh, are able to be creative <laughs> in their lives. And even those arts graduates that don't go on to be artists are using the skills that they learned in art school in a variety of occupations and uh, are quite successful at putting together a meaningful life. So um, I'm going to talk a lot about, you know, what does it mean to have a life of meaning and purpose and how are the arts, uh, how can an, uh, a life organized around the arts in part uh, really build uh, a sense of satisfaction and, and happiness. Um, so. That sounds very cool. I think everybody would really appreciate that when yeah. they go listen to you. Well, you know, we all have the, um, anyone who goes to art school has an Uncle Henry out there who at the holiday, holidays, uh, you know, will say, so what are you majoring in? And you say, um, you know, art or drama. Um, and they say, well, why would you do that? That's a stupid degree. Why aren't you, you know, why aren't you in engineering or accounting or pre-med? And, um, you know, the, I think our data is suggesting, well, you know, Uncle Henry's wrong. Right. Uh, it's not a stupid degree. Uh, people do a lot with it, and they're and they're largely happy that they did it, and would do it again if they were given the choice. So, um, it's a stupid degree if you have a very narrow view of what value means. Awesome. Well, we look forward to your convocation, and even though he said the findings by the book, it's very interesting to read. I read part of it. Great. So, Thank so you. very nice to meet you. Nice Thank to meet you for joining you. us. Sure.